Hello, and welcome to The People's Clerk, the show where you, the citizens of Fulton County, can learn more about the different services available through the Superior Court Clerk's Office and how those services relate to everyday issues that impact the life, the liberty, and the property of the people we serve. I'm Kathleen Tina Robinson, your Fulton County Clerk of Superior Court. Previously, I announced the merger of the Board of Equalization Office with the Clerk of Superior Court as a result of Senate Bill 346, passed by the Georgia General Assembly. The Board of Equalization is governed by Georgia statutes, which require fair and impartial appeal hearings for property owners who wish to challenge the assessment values issued by the Board of Tax Assessors. The clerk's office receives a number of calls from citizens seeking information regarding their property assessments. On today's show, a staff member, Mr. Melvin Richardson, the director of the Board of Equalization Office, will discuss the overall appeal process, the steps citizens should take when challenging property assessments, and how one can become a member of the board. You will also have an opportunity to hear from two current board members. You're watching The People's Clerk. Please stay tuned. Hi, and welcome back to The People's Clerk. As Clerk Robinson mentioned, my name is Melvin Richardson, Director of the Fulton County Clerk of Superior Courts Board of Equalization Office. Today, you will learn more about the overall process of the Board of Equalization and hear from board members Delcy Albritton and David Ray. Welcome to the show. Let's get right to it. Please share with me and the audience, how did you become a member of the Board of Equalization? Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was selected by, uh, randomly selected by the grand jury. Uh, I was sent a letter asking uh, whether or not I wanted to participate. I, I had the same. We got it in the mail. I was curious about it, so I responded and thankfully uh, got accepted. So, Okay. And, and exactly why would someone want to become a member of the board? In my case, it was just a curiosity of uh, how taxes are prepared. I just got done building a home, and so it was under the construction part for a while. Then all of a sudden, the big tax bill came, and so I got involved in trying to understand that and uh, found it very interesting and wanted to be a part of it. So, And also, it's a good idea to um, uh, become a board member. Uh, for the simple fact, you can help others um, with their tax problems. Uh, you also you learn about your own property, and I just think it's very beneficial. And what would the criteria be to become a board member? Primarily, just as uh, when we were taught, is you had to have a high school degree, be 21 years of age, uh, be a property owner in Fulton County itself, and uh, and then you'll go through some uh, training and stuff to be prepared for it. So. You mentioned training. What type of training are you required to go to? We have a 40-hour um, training program that we go through in order to become a, a board member. Wow. Is there any cost associated with this training for, no, for the board no members? Cost. And where is typically the training held? It's normally in the metro Atlanta area training. Sometimes it is maybe in Athens or wherever, but it, the cost, the county, does take care of that. And once you're appointed to the board, approximately how long do you serve on the board? It's a three-year term. You could be uh, reappointed again after that, but uh, under the new uh, code that's changed, but uh, uh, three years is generally the time that's spent on it, so. Yeah. Very beneficial, I think, so. 
Sometimes it's from a year, sometimes it's two, but for the most part it's three. Yeah. And you, you made reference to a 40-hour certification class. Mm -hmm. Is that the only training you must, must go to and attend? No, there's a follow-up training each year that we get for any changes within the code or, or the uh, appraising part. And, uh, so we keep on top of any changes that may take place within the law as well, so that we're prepared, you know, should uh, we need, to, need that information, so. Yes, it's an eight-hour course that you have to be recertified each year um, in order to continue on being on the board. Okay, yeah. and once your term expires, and if you would like to serve again, can you be reappointed? Yes. Absolutely. Is there a you just just reapply, and um, the, it's up to the grand jury once again to uh, select you, and you can move on to being a, a member again. In fact, you'll be re-interviewed by the grand jury, Absolutely. so that you actually semi go through the uh, semi process again, but you won't get your four hours of training again because you had it initially. So, and and if you are selected to be reappointed. Mm -hmm. What's the maximum term can you serve on the second term? Three years. Yeah. So you can serve th another three years? Yes. yes. So potentially you can serve three years. If you're reappointed, you can serve an additional three years. Correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. What experience have you gained by serving as a board member? I've enjoyed it in the, you know, meeting people and learning the experiences that they had and the hardships sometimes they go through as well as a uh, the fellow board members that you're on with too, so it's uh, very, very educational in that way. And a lot of old stories come up and they have some free time, so <laughs> we have a lot of fun, I think. And we, I, I think it's enjoyable because I, I've never been called for a, a jury duty or anything like that, so this opportunity came available and uh, it's kind of like giving back in a sense for everything that you've gotten through the years, so. It's actually it's a public duty type thing. So that's true, and it's rewarding helping others. That's what I get out of it. I enjoy helping other people, and we are equal to everyone. So stick around because up next we'll detail what takes place inside an actual appeal hearing. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Before we went to break, we were discussing the role and requirements of a Board of Equalization member. Now we will walk you through the appeal hearing process. Let me ask you the question, what should a taxpayer bring to an appeal hearing for evidence? Uh, I think they would need to bring in, uh, pictures of their property and properties in their surrounding area. Uh, bring comps, and comps are uh, similar properties that, like their house, if they have, they need um, what? Square footage. Yes. Um, A number of bedrooms and bathrooms, and yeah, if there's damage to the outside, uh, if there's adjoining properties that are boarded up <laughs> or something that could affect their value overall, so because our, our evidence, our decision is based on the evidence that is presented. So the more they have, the better we can get an accurate value. So the more evidence a taxpayer can bring to support his or her decision mm -hmm. works in their favor. Correct. Absolutely. Because all of that evidence is used while you all make your decision. Right. Yes. Right. We have no knowledge of that before the hearing even starts on uh, anything at all. Whatever they walk in with is what we're gonna make our decision from. So Absolutely. the more they have, the better off they'll be. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if they're bringing all of this evidence, then are they also required to also have a legal representation? No, no. no. They can uh, get someone to support them and do it if they didn't wanna come in themselves, but otherwise they would have to have a letter of authorization for that person to do that. But generally, if the property owner comes in themselves and presents it, that's all they need. So. Yeah, and I think it's best that the property owner right. actually come in themselves so they are understand and know what the process really is. Um, 
and we are free. So you will have to pay an attorney, but you you don't have to pay anything if you come on your own. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have an attorney, then there's no cost no. for the taxpayer to come and present his or her evidence. Not right. at all. Well, let me ask this question. What time do you start these hearings and what time do they end? What's the scheduled time? Generally, we start at 9 o'clock uh, and we give uh, about a half hour for each one. And uh, if a person has not been before the board before, we try to explain to them what the process would be. And uh, we give them sufficient time to present their evidence. We give sufficient time for the county to do their side of it. And then they have an opportunity to question each other. And then at the end, we, we uh, ask them to uh, stay so they'll understand their value before they leave and the process that would take place after that, so. Yeah, but generally, it takes at least 30 minutes for the hearings. Each hearing is 30 minutes. So each hearing is 30 minutes. So each, 30 each taxpayer minutes. has 30 minutes to Well, actually, the, the tax assessor has 15 minutes, and the taxpayer have 15 minutes. Right. And totally, that's okay, 30 minutes. OK, so the minutes. hearing is, is the whole within hearing, that 30-minute hearing. block. Correct. Absolutely. Okay, do you sometime have hearings to run over 30 minutes? Yes, we do. We do, and that's OK. That means they probably have more evidence than normal, which is a good thing, and it would work in their favor. So do, you ever, do you ever have occasions when the taxpayer doesn't show up? And if, if not, what, what happens then? Well, it's, it's considered to be called a no-show, and the uh, uh, tax assessor will be coming in. Uh, and he'll have information. Sometimes he has information in his file from the appeal mm -hmm. that there's written uh, statements from the property owner on there that we have to take into consideration. So I always ask for that to make sure. Sometimes they even send in appraisals in those files, sure. which are um, very useful. So in a sense, it's their side of the, of the um, uh, appeal, even though they're not there because they had mailed it in. So I ask for that to make sure that we be able to see that before you know, we just go and make our decision. So it's not a one-sided situation. Whatever it is in that file that was sent in, we review that, even though the person may or may not have been there, so. Okay. And what if I'm a taxpayer, I'm going to my hearing, I'm trying to get there at 9 o'clock. Traffic in Metro Atlanta can be horrible sometimes. I get there 9, 10, 9, 15. What happens? Well, normally, um if, the, if they call in and tell us that they're going to be late, we'll be more than happy to wait for them. But other than that, we, we would start the, the process of hearing the case. And once they get there, they can always join in. Will I still have 30 minutes when I get there, although I may have gotten there late? Yes, I think we would give you enough time to do that, to get your point over. I think we would. It think it depend, right? Well, it depends if there's a hearing right after it. So if we had one at 9 and another one at 9.30 and this person at 9 is 10 minutes late, they would just get basically 20 minutes left of that hearing because mm -hmm. it's unfair to the 9.30 person that was there on time to hold them leaving later yet. So we try to show respect to everybody and making sure that things are pretty well run on time. So. Okay, so I'm a taxpayer. I presented my evidence mm -hmm. in the hearing, the appraiser has presented his or her evidence also. So after we present our evidence, what happens next? The three board members go into deliberation um, and we gather all the evidence that has been presented and we come up with a decision based on the evidence that is presented. And we give them the value. They know what the value is before they leave. Yeah, we do that while they're in the room. Absolutely. So they know their property value before they even leave. And then we inform them that they will get a copy of that within seven to ten business days in mail so that uh, they have an opportunity. And in that letter that they get would be the process to take it further should they not agree with our decision that day. So, But that decision basically holds for three years and is frozen. Uh, by the uh, tax assessor's office. It can't be raised or lowered. It just stayed there unless the property owner then would appeal it the next year, then that would break that freeze, so. Okay. So as a taxpayer, I got there on time. Mm -hmm. I presented my evidence. You all went into deliberation. And you make your decision. Yes. yes. What happens if I just totally disagree with your decision? 
what can I do? Well, you have the opportunity of taking it on to Superior Court, but at that time we do advise you to take an attorney because you would need one to go to Superior Court. And you do have to pay for Superior Court, and like I said earlier, uh, there is no charge for the BOE. But you are entitled to do that. It's explained to them in that letter that they get with this copy of the decision we have, mm -hmm. explains that further and the cost involved with that as Absolutely. well. So. And what process they have to go through to go to the Superior Court. So, And what can the appraiser do if he or she disagrees with the, with the decision that's been made? They can do the same. If they don't agree with our decision, they can take it to the Superior Court judge. I don't yeah. know how often that's happened, but... <laughs> <laughs> We never hear back as to yeah. that part of it, so. And so, once the decision is made, how, as a taxpayer, am I officially notified of that decision? Um, you're notified by certified mail within 10, wor cert ten working yeah, days. Yeah, seven to 10 business days. Yeah. Again. And a copy, well, a copy of your uh, decision will be mailed to you. The original goes to the tax assessor's office but a copy of our decision will be mailed to you within 10 working days. Okay, and, and are these hearings private, closed, are they open to the public, or how exactly what happens? I think the, basically the public could come in, but you know, the, the uh, property owner comes in, the tax assessor comes in, we close the door just for, for privacy, noise-wise, but I've had people come in and sit in on those as well, so. Uh, and property owners brought relatives in, Although we generally let just the property owner speak for himself, not the, somebody else trying to uh, speak into it. So that, but it, uh, it's pretty well open. I think it's open to the public as to what they want to know. There's nothing hidden there, that's for sure. Okay, so when you reach your decision, we inform the hearing is open to the public. You should be there on time. You should bring your evidence. Since the Board of Equalization Office is under the Clerk of Superior Court, Madam Clerk Kathleen Tina Robinson, what influence does she or her office have in you all making your decisions? None. <laughs> <laughs> you want a short, quick answer? None. None whatsoever. At no. all. Uh, other than the swearing in process or going through the grand jury process, uh, that's the last we see of the clerk of the court. So, uh, the people are brought in and they're brought in for hearings with us. Our decisions made, and, and uh, that's the end of it for us. So, nobody comes over, and we get no influence in the tax assessor's office nor the clerk's office. Whatever evidence is presented is what we make our decision from. Absolutely. And we do want to let the public know that we are not affiliated with the tax assessor's office. We were appointed by the grand jury, so we have nothing to do with the tax assessor office. Uh, a lot of uh, taxpayers come in and think that we're all in cahoots with one another, and that's not the case. So I just want to make sure they know that. So you are a quasi-governmental entity, whereas you have no favor or loyalty to the county nor to the taxpayer? Not at all. Well, you all have been excellent guests. Uh, any final thoughts? Tell you how I'm ready. Was it? <laughs> Get carried away. I, I, and we both experienced this several times. Uh, the property owner comes in with uh, evidence, and, and many times if they file for 2013, they'll bring it in for 2013 year, and it's really needed for the prior years because the you know, tax assessor's office makes their market values up until January 1st of 2013 prior to that. So mm -hmm. it's like your income taxes. You know, you pay your income taxes by April the first 15th this year, but it was from the prior year. So the property owner should think of it that way. You bring evidence from your property sales the prior year, which would be more valid and, and you know, used as far as the appeal is concerned. But if you brought it in for 2013, which is the appealed year, we, we are not be able to use that information. So. Yeah, to piggyback off of what he's saying, uh, the county um, appraised their property every January 1 of each year. So if your uh, hearing is in February, you have to bring evidence 
and it's for the year 2013, you have to bring evidence for the year of 2012 or 2011. Right. So it actually has not happened as of the time that they're sitting there. And is this information referenced in the information sheet that goes out for the schedule of peer hearing notice? Absolutely. Yes, it is. It's a lot like I was uh, working with my granddaughter in fourth grade thing here recently, and she was going through and doing her homework. <clears throat> and we got near the end, and she realized she was not doing it right because she failed to read the instructions up front. And uh, this letter that we send out to them when their hearing is going to take place for the property owner, mm -hmm. many times they see the time and the date and they want to be there, but they don't read the little paragraphs in there to make sure is to bring in the correct year of information so that uh, it can be used in the, uh, in the appeal process. So. Yeah, so the taxpayers should be sure to read the entire information sheet right, yes. before appearing to the hearing. Yes. Well, thank you, Delcy. Thank you, David. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, you'll hear final thoughts from Clerk Robinson and our office contact information. Stay tuned. Thanks again for joining us on The People's Clerk. I would like to thank our special guest, Director of the Board of Equalization, Melvin Richardson, and members of the Board of Equalization, Delcy Albritton and David Ray. Today, you were informed about the Board of Equalization process, the laws that govern the board, and the rights you have as citizens to appeal property assessments. This critical process will determine the amount of taxes you will be required to pay. I am honored to oversee the Board of Equalization process. However, please keep in mind that the clerk's office has no direct effect on the outcome of any rulings. Decisions are based solely on the evidence that is presented by the tax assessor and you, the taxpayer. Buying and owning property in Fulton County is a wonderful opportunity that business owners and residents should be proud to experience. The Board of Equalization serves as a key factor in ensuring that your opinions and evidence are equally heard and impartially weighed. If you are interested in learning more information about appealing property assessments, or becoming a member of the board. Please contact our Board of Equalization office at 404-613-7792. That office is located at 141 Par Street, Suite 5001, Atlanta, Georgia 30303. For more information regarding any of our other services, our main office is located at 136 Prior Street, Atlanta, Georgia, 30303. We also have three Fulton County Service Centers to assist you. You can reach us at 404-613-5313, or please visit our website at www.fultonclerk.org. We take pride in assisting every Fulton County resident in every way that we can because we believe in doing the right thing, the right way, each time for every customer. I'm Kathleen Tina Robinson, and I am the People's Clerk. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you the next time.